<laughs> Chapter two. You know, I uh, as I read this, I think you know, church life has really changed during my lifetime. I don't think we had the mega churches that we have now. I think ministry was a little more relational. I don't know if there's been a depersonalization of uh, depersonalization of uh, relationships in our culture, but you just think. Uh, several years ago, and I'll get to my sermon. I, I've said it before. Ron Rand did this plaster the pastor, embarrassed me to death. I didn't ask him to do it. Didn't want him to do it. He gave people there in the church a. Uh, a post it, and he said, "As you write something you, you appreciate about your pastor and post it on him on your way out." So everybody posted these things on me. I took them, didn't read them, and threw them in my desk drawer. I said, "Yeah, their opinion of me will change tomorrow. So why why should I worry about what they think about me today?" So they sat in my uh, drawer um, for two years, and I finally said, "You know." probably should clean out this desk. I'm kind of a hoarder. But maybe I should read those things before I uh, throw them away. So I read them and I wrote down. And you, you know what the number one thing people appreciated about me? My haircut. No, no. Number one thing they said they appreciate, he knows my name. He knows my name. That was the number one thing that people appreciated about me. And uh, I think yours said he calls me Claudia instead of Sylvia. But uh, I, th I think you, you think about Joel Osteen. How many people in his church can he call by name? You, you, these people who stay at home and watch the, the dynamite pastor from California or Texas or wherever, do they, does he even know they're watching him? Could he call them by name? Could he pray for them by name? You know, it, it's it's totally different. But so... And the role of the pastor, even in college, even in seminary, it was moving toward the pastor is a CEO. He, he knows his staff, but he doesn't know his people. His staff know his people. He's just the CEO pulling the strings and then preaching on Sunday morning in the pulpit. My son-in-law was attending a larger church in California and he wanted to speak to the pastor, and he couldn't talk to the pastor for two months. They said, it'll take you two months to get an appointment with the pastor. Right? Now he's on staff at another church. So. But as you look at this, I believe this is Paul's philosophy of ministry. And uh, he says, as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked at night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. As you know, that we dealt with each, each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, com comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and his glory. So when I've preached this in the past, I, I aimed at leaders. T today, I'm going to aim it at everybody. And and this is what I really believe. Loving and faithful relationships are the key to the Christian ministry. And a believer in Jesus Christ is to love people with a gentle love. 
He says, as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. A word, the word you, Paul uses here for mother can be translated nurse. So if we put the two ideas uh, together, we could translate the verse, we were gentle among you like a nursing mother cares for her little children. Well, a nursing mother loves her baby gently, tenderly, and unselfishly nourishes the baby. Uh, a nursing mother cradles and protects her baby. And I've told many of you, when I was visiting Ashley in California, her baby turned four weeks old while we were there. And I was holding the baby, and Ashley was a couple of feet away from me, and she just lunged. She says, you're going to drop that baby. I said, I've had practice. I, I'm not going to drop the baby. She said, no, you're going to drop him. Give him to me. I mean, so she, she protected that baby, and she cradled him and said, I'm putting words in her mouth, Grandpa may drop you, but I won't. So Paul's saying, because you were our spiritual children, we loved you gently, we loved you tenderly, and we loved you unselfishly. We nourished you spiritually by teaching you the truth found in God's word. And we protected you from false teachers. In, in all our dealings uh, with you, we were not pushy. We were not demanding. We were not hostile. And we were not unreasonable. Rather, as ambassadors of Christ, we were courteous, kind, humble, considerate, nice, Friendly, easy to reason with, and patient. You know, uh, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, who was pastoring the church at, church at Ephesus, um, this. He says, the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. And those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Paul wrote the believers in Galatia and told them to be gentle with other believers living in sin. He says, brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Somebody was saying, you know, the Muslims, if they, uh, what they'll do, if somebody's caught in a sin, they'll bury them up to their neck and, and then throw rocks at them. So they're only their heads sticking up and throw rocks. Well, that's not real gentle, but uh, we are to, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself. Believers in Jesus Christ at Ephesus, Philippi, and Colossae. He wrote all the churches and told them, this is what he told the believers at Ephesus, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And to the believers of Philippi, he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. You know, gentleness is so important that the Holy Spirit works to produce gentleness in the lives of God's children. And you know, we pray around here that our lives will be characterized by the fruit of the Spirit rather than our sin nature. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And um, so the question we have to ask us, ourselves is, would we say that we are, or would you say that you and the believers in Jesus Christ, you know, are characterized by gentleness toward unbelievers. Uh, would you say that the believers in Jesus Christ that you know 
and even yourself are, are gen characterized by gentleness toward believers in Jesus Christ who are living in sin, or gentleness toward believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who disagree with us on an issue. There are some, some issues that we can't disagree on and still be Christians. There are other issues that we can disagree on, and we need to disagree agreeably. Agree to disagree agreeably, I guess. As God's children, are, are, we're to be gentle. We're to be courteous, um, kind, humble, nice, friendly, reasonable, patient with all people rather than pushy, demanding, hostile, and unreasonable. Loving and faithful, loving and faithful relationships are the key to the ministry. And uh, secondly, he says, a believer in Jesus Christ is to love people with a sharing love. He says, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Um, Paul and Silas and Timothy, they just didn't share the gospel with the people at the synagogue on the Sabbath and then ignore the people the rest of the week. Uh, they were delighted to share the gospel as well as their lives with the people of Thessalonica. In other words, they made themselves available to people. They befriended and socialized with the people of Thessalonica during the week as well as on the Sabbath. Paul and his friends shared their time, their talents, as well as their spiritual, emotional, and physical resources with the people of Thessalonica. They became their friend. They associated. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said it like this, if you are to have much influence over people, you must love them and mix with them. And if you are to be of service to them, don't act as though you are too good to associate with them. I, yeah, I remember one guy, one pastor, he was depressed. And uh, his office was right across the hall from the sanctuary, the front door of the sanctuary. So uh, the people of the church told me that <clears throat> when it was time for church, he would leave his office and he would go out through the front doors of the church to the sanctuary, then he would go up on the pulpit, preach, and then after church, he'd say the benediction and go across the front hall to his study. He wouldn't stand at the door before the service or after the service, just from his study to the church, to the pulpit, back to his seat, back to his study. When everybody was gone, he'd leave his study. But it, he didn't have much influence over the people. If you want to have much influence over people, you must love them and mix with them. If you're to be of service to them, don't act as though you're too good to associate with them. Just be men among men. Keeping yourselves clear of all their faults and vices, but mingling with them in perfect love and sympathy and feeling that you would do anything in your power to bring them to Christ. Just be one of the guys. You know, when I was at the University of Iowa, I don't know, you hit, you hit my age, you, you think back, do you, do you sometimes think back and remember things or think about people in the past? Well, when I was at the University of Iowa, there were two guys that tried to disciple me, or two guys that tried to influence me for Jesus Christ that were a part of the Campus Crusade movement. The first one was an older student. Now, he was going to disciple me. And uh, he actually got me to move out. I was living with the nine my nine Christian friends from home, so we'd have kegger parties. And I, I wouldn't chip in on the beer. I wouldn't drink the beer, but I would be there and associate with people. But uh, he, got me, he said, you need to move away from those nine Christians, move in with us Christians. So I moved in with him. Well, we lived together for two weeks. 
there were four of us in the apartment. Um, then one day he came into my, we rarely talked to each other uh, during those two weeks. Then one day he came into my room and handed me a couple pieces of paper to fill out concerning my spiritual goals for the year and told me to meet him in the student union later in the week to discuss them. Well, I met him at the student union later that week, but I didn't have my goals filled out. And I kindly asked him if I was his project or his roommate. And I kindly told him that I wasn't interested in being discipled. And I took those papers and I them and threw them away. And uh, I'm sure I wasn't too calm, but second person was the Campus Crusade for Christ staff member. He spent a year uh, just being my friend. We played basketball together. We played football together. We golfed together. We played racquetball. And we played Risk. You ever play Risk? We would play Risk together. And, and we would take rides in his car and have a long conversations. And he would have me over to his apartment for dinner. He would cook dinner. Well, when he told the campus director he wanted to challenge me to be in a Bible study, the campus director told him not to waste his time, that I was unteachable, didn't know if I wanted to live for Christ or live in the world. But he challenged me. He told the campus director, oh, I, don't, I don't believe that. And he challenged me to be um, in his Bible study. And he's probably one of the reasons I'm a pastor today. Uh, several years later, I asked the campus director why that staff member had such an impact in people's lives. And he said, because he loves people unconditionally and he prays for them diligently. And, and so we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to share our lives with others? And as I've said, I always say, there's always room for one more. Are we willing to open up our, our relationals, relationships to more people? Are we willing to give people our time, talents, and energy? And I practice an open door policy. So if, if you don't think I'm calling you enough, or I'm here pretty much every day of the week from 9 to 5.30. And... Uh, it doesn't take two, two months to get an appointment with me and just come through the door because uh, I just practice that open door policy because I believe that relationships are the key to the ministry. That means I do my sermons at home late at night, but that's okay. I'm in the people business. Are we willing to open up our social group for another person? Or are we too busy? Are we willing to love people unconditionally and pray for them diligently? See, loving relation, loving and faithful relationships are the key to the Christian ministry. Thirdly, a believer in Jesus Christ is to love people as a, a self-sacrificing love. Now, the critics of Paul and Silas and Timothy said they just want to take money from you. And I'll be honest with you, the, some of those guys on TV, I really believe that's all they want is your money. Paul wrote, he says, surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardships. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel to you. He said, we didn't want to be a burden to you. Uh, Paul looked at these new believers in Thessalonica as his own children in the faith. And Paul could have told them, now that you've become a believer in Jesus Christ as a result of my teaching, the least you can do is give me some of your money so I can use all of my time to teach others about Jesus Christ. But he didn't. Rather, Paul, Cyrus, Silas, and Timothy chose to work hard while they were in Thessalonica in order to provide for themselves rather than ask new believers in Thessalonica for financial help. Now, since Paul was a tent maker by trade, it's possible he found a job as soon as he came to Thessalonica. 
He knew that while he was in Thessalonica, he worked hard. And uh, he worked con constantly so as not to be a burden to the people who believed in, trusted in, and received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior in Thessalonica. In his second letter, he says this. He says, you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we work night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. And we did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. <clears throat> for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. Now, there is no doubt that Paul believed he had the right to receive financial support. When I went on staff and I was raising support, my family, my brothers and sisters, some of them, some of them never supported me. And they said, when are you going to get a real job? You know, I'm sure you hear that. Right? Um, there's no doubt that Paul believed he had the right to receive financial support from the churches while he preached the gospel. He wrote the believers in Corinth this. He said, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. He says this, don't, don't we have the right to food and drink or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who, who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say that the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is not, is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If, if others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. I like that. Uh, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. If, you, if, if taking on, uh, up an offering hinders the cause of Christ, we're not going to take up an offering. Every church I pastored took up an offering until I got here. And uh, I did have one, one guy, he wouldn't come to our church because we took up an offering. But I grew up in the church. You know, I had no problem going like this to the ushers. Especially if I was the only one in the in the pew, you know, I don't I don't have anything. I always write one check a month. Sometimes these churches think the more you pass your offering plate, the more money you get. Well, that's not the way it goes with me. I know what my income is. I know what percent I'm going to give, and I write a check once a month. Sometimes if the pastor has a really sad story, I might throw in a dollar. I don't. Know. But Paul was willing to accept financial support from his converts after they matured in their faith and understood the responsibility to care for him and help spread the gospel. In fact, while he was in Thessalonica, Paul received a financial gift from the believers in Philippi. Uh, Paul's principle was this. I have a right to receive financial support from believers in the Lord Jesus Christ but it does not mean that I should demand that they give it to me. If taking money from people I'm preaching to hurts my reputation, the preaching of the gospel, I will relinquish my right to receive financial support. As I said, the Campus Crusade staff member who influenced me greatly at the University of Iowa raised his own financial support. He never asked me to support him financially. I helped him fold stuff and stamp his uh, prayer letters for his financial supporters. And I signed my 
letters in Christ's love, just like he did. Um, but he never asked me to support him financially, and I never did. Although I supported other Campus Crusade people who did ask me. And I, I probably should have supported him rather than them. I looked him up online several years ago, and he was still raising his financial support. And, and at the time, he was working with navigators in Washington, D.C., leading Bible studies with the congressman. And his wife was working with the congressman. Wives. He, he was a sharp guy. Loved the Lord. Made a difference in people's lives. But as a church, uh, and me personally, I believe that we have the right to receive financial support from the believers who worship here. But we do not want to pressure people to give. When a genuine believer in the Lord Jesus Christ gives cheerfully as an act of worship to God because they understand that everything they have belongs to God. Everything we have belongs to God. Everything I have belongs to God. And we, they are mere stewards of God's possession, and it is a responsibility and privilege to care for God's work and to help further the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth. We will gladly receive their financial gift and seek to be good stewards with it. You know, we want to be like the apostle Paul and say, he said in Acts 20, 33, we have coveted, we have not coveted anyone's silver or gold. You know, loving and faithful relationships are the key to the Christian ministry. For um, a believer in Jesus Christ is to maintain a good reputation with God and people. Uh, once again, Paul's critics said that he had impure motives and was trying to trick the Thessalonians by deceiving them. But Paul said this, he says, you are witnesses and so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believe. Paul's saying, you and God know that we were men of integrity. We carefully sought to obey God's commands, carefully tried to treat you the way God wanted us to treat you. We were honest and carefully resisted activities that could be taken wrong or resisted activities that would mislead you. Our conduct in Thessalonica was above reproach. Our enemies may be accusing us of wrongdoing, but you and God know the truth. Gene Getz, uh, he started the Bible churches. Uh, Arvis, uh, Sam's dad, would have been a pastor in a Bible church. Probably knew, may, even knew Gene Getz from Dallas because he was from Dallas Seminary. And Gene Getz, he was discussing a good reputation with a group of Christian men, and he asked them what they thought of and what words they might use to describe a Christian man with a good reputation. And here's some of their thoughts. A man with a good rep, Christian man with a good reputation is honest. He's a good father. He loves people. He loves his wife, loves his family, he loves everyone. He's humble. He keeps his word. He's not self-centered, conceited. He makes you feel comfortable. He won't take advantage of you. He doesn't use people for his own ends. He doesn't lose his cool. He's consistent. He admits when he is wrong. He is teachable. He recognizes and respects authority. He doesn't let you down. You know, if we claim to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, people are watching us. People are watching us as a church body. So we need to be careful to trust in God's promises. We need to be careful to obey God's commands. We must be careful to treat people the way God wants us to treat people. We must try to live a life above reproach so that when people accuse us of wrongdoing, 
People will not believe their lies. You know, a good reputation is hard to establish, but a good reputation is a lot harder to keep. And it can be destroyed. Boom. Just like you, you can work for years to have a good reputation and it can be taken away just like that. What kind of reputa reputation do we have? And um, what kind of a reputation does our church have? Loving and faithful relationships are the key to the Christian ministry. And my last point here, and it's not too long. A believer in Jesus Christ is to faithfully challenge others to walk worthy of God. He says, for you know that we dealt with each of you as a father. And it's interesting that he says each of, each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And Paul and his companions, they trained and instructed the believers in Thessalonica as a good, sensible father disciplines his own children. And the word translated encouraging here in the New Testament, uh, NIV, it's translated exhorted in the King James Version. And the word usually takes the form of a rebuke in order to direct people into living the way God wants them to. Exhortation or encouragement might sound something like this. If you continue to go down the path you are traveling now, you're headed for trouble. You're going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt your family. You're going to destroy your life. That, that's real encouraging, but that's or exhortation. You're, you're, you're headed the wrong way. And if you continue to go the way you're going to go, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to get yourself into trouble and you're going to hurt your family. You're going to destroy your life. You got to clean up your act. And the word comforted here uh, means words designed to cheer a person up and to inspire them to live the way they should. Uh, comforting might sound something like this, or you're doing better. I can see positive changes in you. You're going to make it. Keep up the good work. You're doing a great job. And finally, the word ur translated urged in the NIV and charged in the King James means to persuade, urging, and charging. And this is the way Paul says it. I urge you. I charge you. Brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual action. And he tells the believers in uh, uh, Ephesus, I urge you, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. And even though Paul was gentle, he never lost sight of the high demands the Lord Jesus Christ places on his followers. So all of Paul's exhorting and encouraging and urging were directed toward helping the believers in Thessalonica to live obedient lives that are worthy of God. Who has exhorted you? Who has encouraged you? Who has urged you to live a life worthy of God in the past? And who's exhorting, encouraging, and urging you to live a life worthy of God today? And are you exhorting, encouraging, or urging anyone to live a life worthy of God in your sphere of influence? Faith, loving and faithful relationships are the key to the Christian ministry. And... Uh, so, as I say, I think there's a breakdown of relationships in our culture. And I, Cindy's going to 
cringe when I say, I tell my, it's amazing. I tell my kids, you ever read Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People? There's a lot of wisdom there. Or there's a lot of people out there that don't know how to establish or maintain healthy relationships. I think we all need to work very hard at it and ask God to help us love God with all, all our heart, with all our soul and all our might and ask him to give us a love for people. Uh, because he's, Paul says in First the Corinthians 13, without love we're nothing. So let's pray. Father, help us to love people the way you want us to live. love them. Help us to love you with all our heart, with all our mind and all our soul. Help us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And help us to love our fellow believers as Christ has loved us. Help us to live a life pleasing to you. In Jesus' name.